no son de espero me de no lo subo puro rosol y honestito del totelo sofrono So I'm really excited to talk to you about one of my favorite ancient Greek philosophical schools the Pythagoreans and especially the founder of the school Pythagoras we're going to start out in the same time period we've explored recently between about 600 and 400 BC. So we're right in between the archaic and classical periods in ancient Greece. And we're going to spend a bit of time on the island of Samos and uh, Croton, two of the places especially associated with Pythagoras. We're going to explore a bit of the ancient biographical tradition about his life and amazing travels in the communities that formed around Pythagoras. And some of his most important ideas in two domains, sometimes called uh, religious philosophy and mathematical philosophy. But as we'll see, there might be connections between these that aren't obvious on the surface. There's a lot of themes that should come up as we explore. Um, one is how important the search for patterns of meaning and beauty in the world were to the ancient Pythagoreans, whether it was uh, mathematical or scientific beauty or meaning in life. We'll also see how the uh, spiritual or religious views associated with Pythagoras, like the uh, metempsychosis or travel of the soul, are related in surprising ways with the mathematical or scientific ideas that he's credited with pioneering. So let's get started here on the island of Samos. Uh, we're on the coast of Anatolia in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is quite close to another major center that we discussed, uh, Miletus. Samos is very near to Miletus. Croton, on the other hand, the other center especially associated with Pythagoras later in his life, is far west of the other cities we've talked about so far. And we'll explore a little bit about why, what led Pythagoras on this journey so far west. Samos is a beautiful island uh, this is an image and uh, map of Samos from the 16th century on the left, and a reconstruction in part of the temple sacred to Hera here in the 8th century BC. You can see a bit of what a lovely place it would be to visit, uh, the clean water, and the ancient fortifications of the archaeological remains of the old town on Samos, uh, which is now called Pythagorio Town, after Pythagoras himself, its most famous resident. Uh, back in time, uh, Samos was also especially famous for its pottery, the quality of its art. This is an example of the Ionian style of art that was associated with the island as well. So uh, this word Ionian is going to be important in making sense of this island that was the birthplace of Pythagoras. Uh, the Ionian Greeks were uh, connected with people from all over the Middle East, on the coast of Anatolia, what the Greeks called Asia Minor. And this is part of the secret of how their, their pottery, their art, their wine, their technology became especially famous to the other Greeks. Uh, and their art and aesthetics uh, are also part of how their philosophy became so significant. Uh, they were a neighbor of Miletus, another city we've talked about in this series, and sometimes a rival. In the 7th century, there was a war between the island and Miletus called the Lelantine War. Part of that is because they're both really well situated on trade routes and natural rivals for some of the mercantile exchange that's coming through the, the western coast of Asia Minor. Uh, Samos was also partly depopulated by the invasions of the Persian Empire in the later 6th century, and also during the 6th century, but a bit earlier, came to be ruled by a tyrant named Polycrates, who's going to be significant in our story a bit later too. Polycrates, the tyrant of Samos, would become a friend and ally of the Egyptian pharaoh contemporary with him, Amasis. Polycrates also funded a major aqueduct uh, on Samos, which might have been the earliest aqueduct we know of to be intentionally engineered in a systematic way from both sides. So if you put that together with some of the other uh, aspects of Samos's fame, its technology, uh, its art, its culture, you get a sense of uh, how important it was as a cultural center. Some of the most important cultural figures include uh, Aesop, uh, who is the uh, reputed author of stories like The Tortoise and the Hare, Slow and Steady Wins the Race, and of course Pythagoras himself. 
who was reportedly the first person to call himself a philosopher in Greek history. So let's talk a bit about Pythagoras's own life and teaching. Uh, we can start with his childhood, but before we get to the story, maybe we can say a bit about the sources of the story. So there's a number of biographies of Pythagoras that survive from classical antiquity. Uh, for example, uh, by Diogenes Laertius in his Lives of Eminent Philosophers, which dates to about the third century CE, uh, Porphyry of Tyre, a little bit later, uh, Neoplatonist, just like his student and uh, friend Iamblichus uh, in the fourth century. All of them seem quite a bit later than Pythagoras, if you think of the hundreds of years intervening between the sixth century BC and uh, the third century CE. But they're important for us because they also preserve much, much earlier sources, especially sources from a tradition associated with Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum in around the fourth century BC. Even these sources are already a kind of blend perhaps of, of myth and history about Pythagoras, but they're closer to his own lifetime. And in a way there's a lot of uh, consistency or themes that we can draw out of them. It is sometimes said that it's, it's very difficult to get a consistent story about the life of Pythagoras out of these sources. Um, one scholar, Burkert, puts it like this, there's not one detail in the life of Pythagoras that stands uncontradicted, yet it's possible from a more or less critical selection of the data to construct a plausible account. So we're going to try to do something like that, but with a condition. We're going to try to reconstruct the main lines of what we could call the cultural memory or the philosophical memory of Pythagoras among later philosophers and writers in these biographies, and we'll... Uh, take it as it's presented. We'll try to tell the story. At the same time, let's recognize that this is a history to some degree shaped by subsequent memory and philosophy. But it is a meaningful story. And here's how it begins. Pythagoras is said to have been born in, by our reckoning, about 570 BC on the island of Samos to a man named Mnesarchus, who was a successful gem engraver, and a woman named Parthenus, whose name was later Pythaeus, for reasons we'll see in a moment. You can think back here to some of those beautiful Minoan uh, rings and seal stones, although they're from centuries earlier that we talked about a bit earlier in this series. Uh, and think of what Nesarchus was doing and something of the iconography and the importance of this kind of representation that we've already explored, as well as the technical challenges of doing it well. Now, Nesarchus was informed unexpectedly on a visit to Delphi by the Pythia, the oracle, that his wife was with child, which he didn't know, and that their son would better the life of humanity. Um, and he uh, was a pious man who took this oracle very seriously. Uh, he was excited and uh, decided to do the best he could for his son, given the potential destiny that the Pythia had described. His wife, Parthenus, took the name Pythaeus in respect of the Pythia, well, Nisarchus himself built a temple to Apollo and named his child after the Pythia. Uh, so Pythagoras is named literally the voice of the Pythia in the biographical tradition is said to stem from this episode. There were whispers uh, from the story of how uh, Pythagoras' uh, existence came to be known that he might be Apollo's own son as the god at Delphi. And uh, that was interpreted by later philosophers as a sign or indication that Pythagoras was sent to humanity from the god, from Apollo's domain. There's later echoes of this story in the biographies of other philosophers like Plato. For example, Plato's nephew, Speusippus, tells the story of how uh, Plato himself might have been the child of Apollo with Perictyony at the time, a maiden woman. So this story in Pythagoras' life really resonates through the later biographical tradition as well. Uh, growing up, Nesarchus invested heavily in the best paideia or education he could find for the young Pythagoras. And this young man was already getting a reputation as a youth for his peace of mind and his intelligence. And this sort of fostered the rumor that there was something divine about him. In one quote, this is from the Neoplatonist philosopher Iamblichus, an inimitable quiet and serenity marked all his words and actions, soaring above all laughter, emulation, and contention. Uh, the image you can see on screen is of a kouros or a young man in the traditional Egyptian influence pose from Samos. And the archaic smile, as it's sometimes called, on these images with their Egyptian influence uh, 
uh, maybe in a way denotes a bit of this peace of mind that Pythagoras was said to evince. There was a reputation of him as a, a long haired, wise Samian lad that started to spread locally until others, including some of the sages nearby, were said to hear of him. He probably traveled as a child to major Phoenician centers like Sidon. Uh, and there's a reason for this connected with his father's business. So there were big innovations in gem engraving going on at the intersection of Greek and Phoenician culture at the time. They were able to work with harder stones and they had new tools to work with those stones, uh, drills and cutting wheels. So that's a bit of interesting background that will be significant later too. When Pythagoras got to his 18th year, uh, the future tyrant Polycrates, you might remember we mentioned him a moment ago, seized power. He had a personal guard of maybe about 15 men and he was able to uh, bend the constitution of uh, Samos in a way that allowed him to become Turinos or tyrant, a dictator. Uh, this event, by the way, helps to date Pythagoras's birth, but not too exactly because we also aren't quite sure when this tyranny began. The story goes that Pythagoras left Samos at this point. He recognized that the rule of a tyrant wouldn't be conducive to the way of life and study he wanted to pursue. So he started to look for neighbors to Samos with a reputation for wisdom. He sought out Pharisides, who, according to one tradition, became his teacher, and Naximander, who we've talked about a little in our discussion of the Milesians. And in this version of the story, especially a now elderly Thales of Miletus. And Thales advised Pythagoras, who he thought was a brilliant young man, to travel to Egypt and study there with the priests, which Thales himself had also done. Pythagoras had a bit of a roundabout route. So he was very eager to learn uh, from anywhere that he could, at least as the tradition in, in some facets represents him. He went to Sidon again, where he might have traveled with his father as a child to study, and he talked to some of the wise people there, the people uh, who in Greek were called prophets. He was initiated into some of the mystery traditions in Sidon with the Phoenicians and learned while he was there that the mysteries originated in Egypt. This led him to want to travel to Egypt, and he had some unexpected help and a bit of a close shave. So some Egyptian sailors who landed on the coast under Mount Carmel where uh, Pythagoras was thought that this uh, young, uh, fit, and highly educated uh, man could probably fetch a high price as a slave. So they thought they could capture him uh, and maybe while well, conveying him where he wanted to go, plan in the end to sell him. But they found something so divine in his self-mastery and, and the way he made the whole ocean voyage in silence and peace, as the story goes, that they decided there was something godly about him. And they decided to nourish him instead. And they gave him all the food and supplies that he needed and helped him out. They became his friends. So he made it to Egypt. But when he got there, he had a lot of trouble getting the initiation and welcome to be taught at an Egyptian temple that he sought. So he reached out actually to the, the tyrant, um, Polycrates of Samos, who was then on good terms with the Pharaoh in Egypt, Amasis, to see if Polycrates could sort of write a letter of reference for him to encourage Amasis to help. And he did. So Amasis wrote a letter in turn to the priests and uh, Pythagoras went on to the temple at Heliopolis to study. Uh, this is around the Nile Delta, not far from modern Cairo. But the priests there um, weren't prepared to accept him and said, in any case, he should try to find an older temple. So he went further up the Nile, that is further into Upper Egypt in that direction, or what we would think of as south, uh, to Memphis, and finally reached Thebes, the center of the god Amun. Uh, those priests were prepared to take him in, but on, again, this biographical tradition, laid some intensive precepts and discipline on him, thinking he would be dissuaded, but he wasn't. And they were, uh, they, they were led to respect his commitment and accepted him as a pupil. Pythagoras then learned the Egyptian language, uh, the script, the hieroglyphs, and the underlying language, was initiated and trained by the priests of Amun, and studied in Egypt for an amazing 22 years. Uh, topics including astronomy, geometry, and theology. We'll look a bit more at this in a moment. Um, the, the temple complex of Karnak, the precinct of amun Re. Uh, at Thebes can still be seen today, and it's, it's enormous and beautiful and breathtaking. It's worth saying a little bit about this uh, sabayit, or teaching in Egyptian education, the tradition of 
hieroglyphic scribal learning that had been running for millennia before we even get to this time. Uh, there was a whole sort of set of organized encyclopedic knowledge or cosmology in these word lists that the Egyptian priests and scribes would study. It ranged through all aspects of reality, astronomy, names of places, human professions, uh, animals, uh, different kinds of interesting wordplay that would allow for symbolic and polyvalent meanings to emerge in writing, uh, geography, uh, arithmetic and geometry, which are obviously going to be significant in our treatment of Pythagorean mathematics. Um, some of the ways, again, uh, thinking back to our conversations about Thales, that uh, abstract formulae might be implicit in this knowledge, but sometimes formulated by example rather than as general laws. And of course, ethics, as well as theology and ritual practice. So encyclopedic here is a good word from the Greek, uh, in kuklos, uh, sort of in a whole circle and paideia education, a totality of education about the world. Um, there is some local evidence in Egyptian for the priests and the teachers in these traditions being willing to teach foreigners, but this is fairly rare. So it's consistent with the biographical tradition that Pythagoras had to really work to demonstrate that he would be up to this challenge and was a good choice for initiation. A few uh, developments after this led to Pythagoras getting to study in yet another major Middle Eastern center of learning. So the Achaemenid ruler Cambyses II marched on Egypt in 526. Uh, at that point, it was ruled by Amasis' son. Pythagoras would have been in his 40s, if we follow this chronology roughly. He was captured in the invasion and taken to Babylon, which was one of the centers of the Achaemenid Empire, and already at that time, another city with uh, traditions of learning millennia old. Uh, we have, again, some of the remains uh, from uh, Babylon available to us uh, to see, but the actual place is in Iraq. Uh, you can see here uh, the remains from the Ishtar Gate, uh, the gate named for the goddess Ishtar, earlier Sumerian Inanna, later uh, Greek uh, Aphrodite, and something of the sense of just the sheer scope and beauty of this monumental architecture. In some way, when he was there, Pythagoras was able to study with the Magi uh, from the Greek Magoi, uh, topics including their theology, ritual practice, arithmetic, music, and other sciences, uh, augmenting and expanding what he'd already learned. This seems relevant to some of our later knowledge about Pythagorean mathematics and scientific knowledge in the following way. So the earliest example we have on record of Pythagorean triples, as we call them today, that is three positive integers, A, B, and C, such that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or if you think of it geometrically, uh, right angle triangles such that the area of the square constructed on the hypotenuse of the triangle is equal to the sum of the areas on, of the squares on the other two sides. So the earliest examples we have of, of triples like that are from a Babylonian tablet um, much earlier, uh, written about 1800 BC, uh, which you can see on screen as well. So what we think of as the, the Pythagorean theorem, a particularly distinctive uh, understanding of this rule that can be demonstrated about right angle triangles, there's examples of this going back much earlier in Babylon where Pythagoras is said to have studied. But here too, we might uh, ask whether there's something special about the way that Pythagoras came to formulate this kind of uh, set of examples as a general demonstrable uh, pattern or law and we'll come back to that a little bit later as well as a possible way of exploring his synthesis of the knowledge he learned through these explorations. Uh, at the age of 56, as the story goes, Pythagoras returned to the island of Samos. And uh, now back home again, he conducted research or zetasis, a kind of pattern of inquiry and contemplation in a cave, uh, following the manner of Minos of Crete, Tropon Mino, as Iamblichus reports. He also founded uh, what the Samians knew as the semicircle, a uh, kind of community outdoors where Samians could engage in free and open public debate and study. He planned to establish a system of education on Samos at home, which would have been based on Egyptian symbolic education, the kind of study that he engaged in while he was in Egypt. In addition, he wanted to teach uh, mathematics and geometry, but he had some limited success getting the Samians really excited about this. Uh, there's actually some anecdotes of Pythagoras paying young people in the city to study. Uh, 
So it was a little tricky to get them engaged with these deeper philosophical domains. Uh, partly as a result, maybe he decided to keep traveling. So he continued his research abroad. As part of this, he visited some of the major oracle sites of Greece. Uh, the tradition in Diogenes Laertius and Porphyry is that he studied under one or more of the Pythias of Delphi, either Themistocleia or Aristocleia. It's possible that actually both are true. So the later uh, Platonist philosopher Plutarch in the first century tells us that in the heyday of the oracle, there were three Pythias operating simultaneously. Uh, so we also know from Plutarch and other sources that Clea is a pretty typical element in a Pythia's name or title. In fact, the Pythia of Plutarch's own day, who was uh, a friend and philosophical uh, colleague of his, was named Clea. So it wouldn't be too strange if Themistocleia and Aristocleia were two different Pythias and uh, Pythagoras studied under both. In any case, the story goes that there were a number of ethical views that he developed following uh, this study with the Pythia. He also studied on Crete with uh, a Gnosian philosopher named Epimenides, uh, one of the seven sages in the cave of Mount Ida, the birthplace of the Cretan Zeus. So you can think of some of the Minoan lore and background, perhaps in Greek cultural memory, at least, uh, being part of this Pythagorean story. He studied further in Crete and Sparta, uh, which already had a reputation for the uniqueness of their law codes. And you might remember we've talked a little bit before about what was unique in the Cretan polis and how some of their policies or approaches uh, to, for example, common meals, and redistribution of goods and equality of citizens, uh, and in Sparta, the relative equality of women in the community, how all of these drew attention and might have earlier antecedents, perhaps some of them going back to the Aetio-Cretan law codes. Uh, after all of this, um, Pythagoras went back again to Samos on arrival, he was now getting well known enough that he was enlisted into the diplomatic, public, uh, and political affairs of the island. And he didn't really want to be so drawn into that that he couldn't continue to work on philosophy. At the same time, he continued to have a hard time getting Samians to engage with the more advanced studies he wanted to invite them into. This is a kind of early example of a tension that becomes very familiar later between more practical sort of... Um, political or policy related philosophy and more theoretical contemplative philosophy. The upshot of all this is that Pythagoras determined at some point in his life that he would move to Italy to uh, a newer, younger community, in some ways, Croton, uh, and there uh, bring together students who could engage in some of the different kinds of philosophy that he had studied through his travels or formulate a new community. So by this point, we've talked about a lot of places. So let's just quickly recap where Pythagoras has been in our story so far by his mid fifties. He started out on Samos, uh, traveled a little bit in uh, Phoenicia, went to Egypt, then Babylon after 22 years in Egypt, back to Samos, around Crete, uh, into the Greek mainland, studying different oracle traditions, places like Delos, uh, Sparta, Crete with Epimenides, back to Samos again, and now he's leaving Samos and going to Croton over here on the west in Italy. So a little bit about Croton. Um, Croton, although I just said in some ways it could be seen as a younger community, uh, was pretty old by this time as well. It was established in about 710 as part of uh, what was later known as Magna Graecia, uh, which was the growing network of Greek colonies in Southern Italy. In fact, there's still people in South Italy who speak a dialect of Greek. Uh, like many colonies of that time, Croton exhibited a strong and early connection with Delphi. Uh, the oracle at Delphi would often guide uh, expeditions or communities trying to find a new place to live as a colony. And in this way, we notice that even the Delphic tripod is represented in the early coinage of Croton. So this Delphic connection uh, rings true and strong here. There was a population by about 500 that was quite large by Greek standards, between 50,000 and 80,000 people, important temples of Apollo and Hera. Uh, and uh, Croton became pretty famous for its sports victors in the Pythian games at Delphi and at Olympus, especially from 588 on. Also for medical practitioners. So a doctor from Croton named Demosides became pretty famous in the sixth century. Uh, he was captured by the Persian empire and promptly cured a dislocated ankle for King Darius. And this won a lot of prestige for his city as well. 
So what about this community that Pythagoras formed when he got there? Uh, it was so distinctive that it uh, really sort of gave rise to the notion that there's something unusual and special about the philosophical way of life that the Pythagoreans uh, exemplified. Plato writing uh, later in the Republic, uh, now in the fourth century BC, suggests that uh, the followers of Pythagoras call their way of life Pythagorean and are conspicuous or recognizable. And we'll see some of the ways that their communities are particularly conspicuous compared to other Greek communities. Pythagoras's community as it developed in Croton, we're told, had uh, eventually two natural divisions, though we're not quite sure of the character of these divisions. The first was the so-called akousmatikoi. This is from the Greek verb um, akuo, which is really to hear. Uh, so an akousmata uh, or a set of akousmata are things heard. Um, these are the hearers and they follow the ethics and the outward way of life recommended by Pythagoras. Then there's the mathematikoi. That's where we get the word mathematics. It can just mean learning. In Greek, mathesis is learning. Um, in fact, Pythagoras is traveling all over and learning was called polymathie, lots of mathe, um, by some of uh, the later philosophers that we've talked about and we'll talk about again. But uh, beyond just meaning mathematics, uh, this kind of learning can mean a deeper study of philosophy. So on the one hand, the uh, akousmatikoi are sometimes seen as the more ethical or religious followers who take precepts Pythagoras offers and try to live by them, where the mathematikoi are seen as those who study and try to understand the meaning behind those precepts. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes the akousmatikoi are seen as the more religious of the followers of Pythagoras, while the mathematikoi are seen as the more scientific. Um, there's also a view that they reflect different sects that developed in the decades after Pythagoras's own life. Uh, and on one view that we'll explore a bit more, they're really the same set of ideas being adopted by, in a way, the same community, but one group is taking them more exoterically or literally, while another group is trying to understand their esoteric meaning. And we'll talk a bit more about why in a moment. But let's say a bit more if we can about what makes the community seem so unique or conspicuous in Plato's language. One point is that they abolish private property. So shared property among friends or the law koina tafilon, um, the things that friends are all held in common uh, becomes a facet of Pythagorean life. And part of this is the tradition of shared meals, which as we saw was also Spartan and Cretan going back quite a while. Vegetarianism is a little more unusual. So uh, Pythagoras encourages all his followers to avoid eating meat as well as some kinds of beans. Uh, the equality of women and men, we know of a number of women teachers in Pythagorean communities and philosophers in roles of uh, relative authority. So this is also something fairly unique about Pythagorean communities and of course, their devotion to philosophy in general. There's other factors, uh, what they wear, how they dress, how they're marked out in society um, that uh, sets Pythagoreans apart, as well as their commitment to a certain degree of secrecy about the teachings that they've received. Here's a bit more about these two aspects of the Pythagorean community. Um, so this is a quote from Iamblichus, the later Neoplatonist philosopher, um, but it's possible sources in Aristotle. There's two kinds of the Italian philosophy called Pythagorean, uh, that belonging to the akousmatikoi, the hearers, and that belonging to the mathematikoi, the learners. Of these, and this is a bit of a different perspective, focusing on how they could be seen as two different sects, the akousmatikoi were admitted to be Pythagorean by the mathematikoi, but they in turn did not recognize the mathematikoi, but claimed that their pursuits weren't those of Pythagoras, but those of Hippasus. This is uh, Hippasus of uh, Metapontum, an early Pythagorean or pupil of Pythagoras and a music theorist who was also credited with the discovery of irrational numbers. The philosophy of the akousmatikoi consists of unproved and uh, these akousmata to the effect that one must act in appropriate ways so they're ethical. And they also try to preserve all the other sayings of Pythagoras as divine dogma. These people claim to say nothing of their own invention and say that to make innovations would be a mistake, would be wrong but they suppose that the wisest of their number are those who have got the most akousmata. So in, on this view, this is a group who is taking the Pythagorean teaching a bit more literally. When Pythagoras says to be vegetarian, they'll follow that way of life. They'll take that as an akousma, 
And uh, because of that, that's in their view what Pythagorean philosophy amounts to. As we'll see, the mathematicoi, in addition to further pursuing mathematical inquiry, also try to understand or interpret the acousmata uh, in some way as, as if they have a deeper meaning. And what Iamblichus is saying here is that the exoteric acousmaticoi at some point became hostile to the esoteric mathematicoi, those who tried to interpret the deeper meaning, but this hostility was not reciprocal. The mathematicoi were happy to accept the acousmaticoi. So that's a, a bit of interesting Pythagorean social history, though again, it's um, developed and shaped by later thinkers. Let's come back to Pythagoras himself, because that's all some distance out maybe after his life, uh, this distinction being drawn so clearly. Pythagoras is said to have uh, espoused a particularly broad social philosophy that he encouraged the people of Croton to follow. There is an address he gave to the ruling government in Croton, including the elders of the city, after he made a hit with the youth of the city. And he argued to them that a government should be equal with all its citizens. Um, so uh, that would mean that the government shouldn't um, stand above the citizens. The only thing that should stand above the citizens is justice. Uh, he also encouraged them to dedicate a temple to the muses because symphony, harmony, and rhythm would cultivate concord in the city. He offered different views to the youths and the women he met in Croton in addresses at the Temple of Apollo and Hera, not to attack anyone, not to take revenge, uh, to value learning, uh, to foster fidelity between spouses. Uh, this interesting point that Iamblichus reports that he encouraged husbands to submit to their wives as wives to their husbands. Uh, the idea that was, it, it seems somewhat novel to the people of Croton, that sexual intercourse was compatible with holiness, both for women and for men, uh, even on the same day. After uh, the city of Croton had adopted some of the recommendations of the Pythagoreans and they'd become an important sect in the city. So these recommendations, including the government being equal with citizens, uh, value for justice, some of these moral precepts, at least as the Pythagorean tradition remembers these events, um, the Pythagorean communities were later driven out of Croton, and Pythagoras might have spent his last years in Metapontum nearby, which, by the way, is where Hippasus was from, who we talked about a moment ago. But they would influence both through the structure of their communities and the practice of philosophy, uh, later thought very significantly, especially through the Academy of Plato, which itself had a strong Pythagorean quality. A little bit more about how Pythagoras taught, and we've used this word symbolic and in some ways esoteric a few times, and it's, it's worth maybe drawing out what, at least in later memory, this meant. Uh, so Pythagoras would say things like, don't step over the bar of the scale. Don't sit down on your bushel. Don't eat your heart. Don't stir the fire with a knife. And these would have different levels of meaning. So one would be an ethical level of meaning. Don't step over the scales bar would mean don't transgress what's fair. Don't sit down in your bushel would mean take equal thought for today and for the future. Uh, don't eat your heart would mean don't waste life on regret, sorrow, and pain. Don't stir fire with a knife. Don't unnecessarily provoke people. Uh, so that's one way of teaching these sort of pithy sayings that are memorable and a little bit enigmatic. Sometimes they're called enigmata and compared to Delphic oracles which also invite hermeneutics or exegesis, that is in Greek, interpretation or drawing out. In addition to their ethical meaning, they can have a deeper or metaphysical or theological meaning for the Pythagoreans as well. A similar mode of teaching connects with these, uh, these sayings called akousmata or hearings. So for example, Pythagoras would ask, well, what are the islands of the blessed in uh, Greek memory where immortal heroes go uh, in the next life? The answer is the sun and the moon. What is the oracle at Delphi? The answer is the Tetractus, which we'll talk about a, a little bit later in Pythagorean mathematics, the very thing which is the harmony of the sirens, that is the music of the spheres. What is the wisest number? And the next is the power of naming or language. So this is a way of teaching uh, through uh, symbols and uh, memories of a mythic worldview as well as new kinds of enigmata or riddles that require unpacking and reflection. On the view of Iamblichus, who's reporting some of this information, this is a sort of study that is really the wisdom of the early Greek sages, namely 
what's both really good and difficult to know oneself. So as much as some of this uh, might seem uh, a bit puzzling, some of it seems ethical, some of it seems cosmological, reflection on these ideas is supposed in a way to lead to self-knowledge and self-understanding and authenticity in a way. Um, what's most difficult is contrasted with what's easy, and that, Yambuka says, is to continue following your habits. We could say habits of uh, movement, of feeling and uh, reaction, of mind, uh, our habits of, of thinking about things, representing things to ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves. So to try to recognize all of those habits in movement, feeling, and thought, uh, the three parts of the soul later or the psyche later for Plato, uh, and in some way to really know ourselves and somehow develop or transform is uh, part of the initiation or the mystery of Pythagoreanism as these later Platonist authors represent it. Um, there's a bit more to say about this too, because it fits into a, a bigger pattern of uh, symbolic teaching that later Greeks at least would see Pythagoras as drawing from the Egyptians in particular, and from the Oracle at Delphi and associated oracles in Greece. This passage from uh, Plutarch, preserved by Eusebius, uh, is an interesting example. The suggestion that the philosophy of the ancients was generally concealed in myths or legends, enigmata and allegories that contain statements clearer to most people than the silent omissions. It's also in the Orphic poems in Egyptian and Phrygian stories, and especially in the initiations of the mysteries. We've heard a little of this kind of language before in Diodorus Siculus, uh, talking about Orpheus, who learned from the Aetiocretans, uh, on one suggestion at least, the indigenous Minoan people of Crete, and from his learning with them brought initiatory rites and mysteries to the Greeks because on Crete at Knossos, where Pythagoras also studied, it has been the custom since ancient times that these initiatory rites should be handed down openly to everyone. This language of interpreting or unpacking uh, enigmata or enigmas in the quest for self-knowledge is also how some other pre-Socratic philosophers represent the work of the Pythian oracle at Delphi. For example, here, Heraclitus, who says, the Lord whose oracle is at Delphi, that is Apollo, neither speaks nor conceals, but gives a sign, semine. Uh, and this sign too is sometimes called an enigma, um, maybe most vividly in our literary record, Socrates at Apollo, speaking of the enigma the Pythia offers when she says Socrates is the wisest. He spends uh, the next decades trying to unpack this, saying that he thinks needs interpretation and eventually learns that, on his view, it's about humility respecting human wisdom. So what does this have to do with Pythagoras? Again, in the later tradition of the Platonist, which Plutarch also reports, Pythagoras imitated the Egyptian patterns of symbolism and uh, the mysteries by interspersing his teaching with these kinds of enigmata that required or invited interpretation on many levels. For many of the Pythagorean sayings, as Plutarch reports, are not lacking in the lore of the writing, which is called the hieroglyphic. What does this have to do with the Egyptian writing system? You might think back to some of that uh, special interpretive symbolic meaning and even wordplay that we uh, heard a bit earlier was part of the scribal learning in Egypt and also incidentally part of the scribal learning in Babylon in cuneiform. One Egyptian interpretation, for example, is that a child coming from a lotus is a depiction of sunrise, which is true in the hieroglyphic script, and on another level can mean the conquest of death. A lot of this is about Greek impressions of Egypt uh, and the teaching of the priests there, but some of it is, is genuinely similar, as far as we know, to these earlier uh, writing systems and how they were used to preserve, unpack, and maintain a sort of polyvalent series of ideas. Um, one article on screen here by Griffith's Allegory in Greece and Egypt uh, in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology points to those points. Uh, you can also take a look at Garth Vauden's book, The Egyptian Hermes, on the later Greek cultural memory and on the social context um, between uh, Greek learning and Egyptian priests, Ian Moyers, Egypt, and the limits of Hellenism. So that gives us a bit of a sense of, of the connection between Pythagoras' studies in Egypt, on Crete, with the oracle at Delphi. Uh, with this mode of teaching, and at least, again, in the cultural memory of those who brought together these stories of his biography, how those all hang together somehow with this project of, of self-knowledge. So that leads us naturally to some of Pythagoras' key ideas. Um, this is tricky, 
no written works are definitely attributable, attributable to Pythagoras, even though his followers wrote a lot and often credited their ideas to him. That makes it kind of extra challenging. So we're looking at generations of Pythagorean learning and development where all of it is attributed to Pythagoras himself. But the core concepts that um, are sometimes traced back to Pythagoras can be divided, at least by modern scholars, into two categories. One, a set of ideas that seem more concerned with what we in our categories coming, say, from, from English or Anglophone scholarship might call religious philosophy. For instance, ideas concerned with the reincarnation of the soul and a set of ideas that are more mathematical, like geometrical theorems, the search for patterns in nature. It's important to stress, though, that there's not such a clear category of religion in antiquity that would suggest this kind of divide. An alternative division would be uh, to look at those ideas that are expressed more exoterically in the language we've used, those that were maintained by the akousmatikoi, and those that are more esoteric, the symbol interpretation that was associated with the mathematikoi. There's challenges associated with that kind of distinction as well. Um, but it allows us to think a bit more about the sort of hermeneutical or interpretive practice that at least in later philosophical memory was especially associated with Pythagoras. And here's one example of how it could be practical. Um, we know that Pythagoras strongly encouraged vegetarianism to the akousmatikoi. At the same time, at least as Diogenes Laertius reports in one tradition, uh, this insistence on vegetarianism was also a screen or proschema for the habituation of an ethical state of mind or a psychological development uh, in the psuche or psyche of the student. That is, for them to become associated and familiar with uh, sustainable living, with moderation. Having learned how to have a healthy relationship to uh, nourishment, to food and appetite, one would have achieved the, uh, the more esoteric goal, even if there's even deeper levels of meaning, beyond the literal interpretation of abstinence from meat. Uh, so that's an example, even though it goes deeper than that, of how on the one hand you could imagine in Iamblichus's terms, the akousmatikoi taking literally a very good practice in some ways, vegetarianism, which is great, uh, but at the same time, if they were reluctant to go deeper and understand the reason for the injunction to vegetarianism in this psychological change, as the mathematikoi did, uh, then it might not be integrating uh, more levels of this Pythagorean teaching. Uh, so we're drawing on lots of different evidence from different time periods and sources here, and there's certainly a reason not to push these points too far, but at least it's, it's an interesting way of telling the story coherently about how these different perspectives on Pythagoras develop and what they might mean for us. A lot of this evidence, speaking of, of how that coherent story comes about, is again from sources linked with the academic tradition of Plato and later Aristotle, remembering that Plato's academy included a number of self-identifying Pythagoreans, and that was significant in the structure of academic learning for Plato as well. So let's talk a little bit about one of Pythagoras's most famous or celebrated, we might say, more spiritual or more ethical or religious ideas. And this is metempsychosis. That's uh, in Greek, um, well, the psyche part, the soul or psyche or person, um, the M part means in, and the meta part is sort of moving meta from one place to another. So the soul or psyche that moves from one place to another or occupies or takes up different bodies. According to Herodotus, uh, our friend, the historian again in book two, which is largely about Egypt, the Egyptians were the first to say that uh, the human psyche is immortal. And each time a body perishes, the psyche enters into another living being as it is born. And some Greeks have adopted this doctrine. There's a lot of debate about the meaning of this passage and exactly what this notion of reincarnation or metempsychosis in the Greek or in, in our English terms might have meant in an ancient Egyptian cosmology and language and, and worldview, or whether Herodotus has, has confused things here. But if we take seriously what he means, it connects well with his final saying that some Greeks have accepted this doctrine or adopted it, remembering Pythagoras' study in Egypt, because according to other sources, Pythagoras was the first to introduce these views about reincarnation into Greece. And he definitely, and at least going from the general Pythagorean evidence, 
had really interesting views about the psyche. There's this one saying that is very vivid. Some Pythagoreans declared that the psyche is the motes in the air, others that it's what causes the motes to move. That's a re very mysterious and again, maybe symbolic suggestion. Uh, if it were to be unpacked, what might the Pythagoreans have meant by that idea? Uh, and if you do just watch motes in the air, it's very vivid. Here's a saying that really brings home this idea as well, how it connects with uh, vegetarianism for Pythagoras. Stop, he's reported as saying, don't beat that puppy. It's the psyche of a man, a friend of mine. I recognize that, that psyche. So recognizing uh, reincarnation or metempsychosis becomes represented as a motivation for kindness to non-human animals uh, and generally an attitude of non-violence. So that's an interesting connection. There's another aspect to this sort of uh, uh, reincarnation theory or metempsychosis theory that Pythagoras adopts. According to one author, Heraclides Ponticus, uh, again, we're connected with Plato's Academy in this report, Pythagoras remembered his own past lives. He said that he'd been born, he remembers all the way back uh, many generations, to being born as Ithalides, a son of the god Hermes. And Hermes offered him a gift to choose anything except immortality. So he asked to remember, both alive and dead, a memory of what happened to him. This story goes on a lot further, but Pythagoras relates his past lives with proofs and examples that allow a certain degree of verification, and then notes that his psyche and some of these memories he's had had belonged earlier to plants and non-human animals. So in a way, he directly experienced what we might call uh, the philosophical view of panpsychism, recognizing that there is a psyche in everything. Those who have thought a bit about the Milesian philosophers like Thales, who you remember Pythagoras is also said to have met, uh, will remember Thales saying, uh, everything is full of gods, which Aristotle interprets similarly as the suggestion that there is psyche, sort of motive force, and in another sense here, sentience, uh, in everything that there is. Some of these ideas are later associated in Greek tradition with the movement called Hermeticism as well. So let's talk a bit more about uh, Pythagoras's mathematical ideas, having looked at some of these ethical and, and religious ideas, granting that those categories may not quite apply. According to Aristotle's testimony, again, most Pythagoreans held that reality is somehow fundamentally mathematical. Things are numbers or are constituted of numbers. As Aristotle says in uh, his report about these Pythagoreans in the first book of the Metaphysics, um, that's in addition to the more obvious point that things are measurable by numbers. It's not so hard to say we can measure things with a ruler in a geometrical quantity with a line or that we can count, but to say that things actually are numbers, that's what Aristotle thinks is particularly significant. In any case, this does point to the Pythagorean interest in generalizable mathematical patterns, ratios that are expressible in geometrical and musical form, because they work a lot with music theory as well, and later in, in post-Pythagorean, or at least quite a bit after our period, uh, explorations in algebraic notation associated with Arabic philosophy. So mathematics, however we do it, geometry, music, algebra, in these different symbolic expressions can offer, as we know so well today, tremendous predictive insight into reality. We can recognize patterns or laws that structure and predict natural events. But again, there's more in Aristotle's story. Even though that's true for the Pythagoreans, they're really interested in the patterns that can be used to predict nature. They also think that reality is deeply mathematical. So I'll try to say a bit about this, this theory and how it develops, at least again, for some of the later Platonist Pythagoreans who, looking back, uh, are, are remembering this idea as Pythagoras's own, and it may have been. The elements of number are the even and the odd. The even is the unlimited and the odd is limit. The two together, limit and the unlimited, you could almost think of them like a cookie cutter and cookie dough, the cookie dough that just sort of, um, you know, flows out past the cookie cutter and the cookie cutter that brings shape and character to the cookie. They come together to make this wonderful, flavorful cookie. What's the cookie? It's a unit, it's a number that comes out of these two uh, elements. Um, and numbers somehow go to make up the whole cosmos. In fact, there's a saying of some of the later Pythagoreans that uh, the human psyche is a self-moving or self-changing number a number that kind of keeps on going. Uh, 
you might almost think of this maybe it's a bit impressionistic, but today like a like the number pi, like an aperiodic repeating, but not just sort of mechanically repeating pattern. Uh, this notion of the self-moving, self-changing number for them is integral to understanding human nature. So pulling back from that a little bit, how is it the case that number generates the cosmos we see and encounter? So this has to do with that word we encountered before in the answer to the question in the Akuzma, what is the oracle at Delphi? With this esoteric or mysterious answer, the oracle is the Tetractus, which is also the music of the spheres. The Tetractus is the symbol you'll see at the upper right of the screen right now. It's triangular, maybe no big surprise there. At the top level, there's one point. Below that, there's two points. Below that, there's three points. And below that, there's four points. If you add them up, one plus two plus three plus four is 10, which gives us, uh, at least in a sort of base 10 decimal system, everything we need for the building blocks to make up a uh, number, uh, a whole system of arithmetic and mathematics. So that's part of the picture of the Tetractus seen as a kind of fount of uh, reality in number. But here's a way we can maybe give a bit more shape to this idea. Um, in Plato's Timaeus, and again, in some of the Platonic views that to some degree are projecting back or finding the ideas we know to be Platonic in the earlier Pythagoreans, uh, which for the moment we'll explore as a kind of single coherent tradition, granting there might be a lot of questions about how we use this evidence wisely, um, we can see the Tetractus used as or explored as a sequence from point to line to plane to solid geometrical figure. And that gets us toward a cosmos we can see, touch, taste, hear, and smell. Um, I'll come back to that in just a moment to say more about the Tetractus. Uh, just to say briefly, even though we're going to focus on the Tetractus, it's not the only one of the different theorems that are associated with Pythagoras. Maybe most famously today, the Pythagorean theorem about right angle triangles is particularly significant. This already encodes, though, the tension of rational and irrational numbers, of limit and the unlimited, of whether uh, everything is representable as a ratio of two positive integers or not. Um, these questions involve the relationship between the cookie cutter and the cookie dough from the Pythagorean metaphysical perspective. So to what degree, uh, when we uh, bring a sort of patterning uh, cookie cutter like limit to the unlimited flow of, of experience, or if you like, to what degree when we bring a discrete number line like structure to the continuous flow of geometry and curves, uh, is it possible to capture the curve in the linear? Uh, well, it isn't entirely. There's always a sort of remainder. There's always more to go. And so the idea that there's always cookie dough outside any cookie cutter is an important part of Pythagorean thought, and it even comes up in the Pythagorean theorem in incommensurability. Uh, so you can't just reduce the one line to the units of the other. Cosmologically, too, this is significant. So there's a kind of music of the world for the Pythagoreans that emerges from the encounters between the cookie cutter and the cookie dough of the unlimited and limit making up number, making up reality. Uh, in the Platonic and Aristotelian sense, there's a kind of patterning structure. And then there's, you might remember from some earlier conversations about Aristotle, this sort of dynamic buzzing field of potentiality to be something. Uh, and the two together go to make up our experience. And this is sort of a little bit intuitive. There's patterns of meaning that we're always looking for, whether they're mathematical and quantitative or qualitative or otherwise. And then there's the, the data, the experience that is just flowing by. And we're always trying to find meaning in the experience, but it can't be too exhaustive. There's always some cookie dough that overflows that search and gives us more to aspire to, or at least that's the way some of these philosophers interpreted the Pythagorean meaning of philosophia, the search for wisdom that keeps on going. So I wanna say a little bit more about the Tetractus itself. Uh, here at the top, we've got a point. And this point uh, is, we imagine a mathematical point without dimension. We come now to a second point and the possibility of a line or a dimension, a diastema or extension between them. Uh, this is the second part of the Tetractus, the two, 
Now we imagine stretching out a third point. And with three points, we come to plane, or what the Pythagoreans called a plane number, a plane figure like a triangle, and the third step in the tetractus. Finally, a fourth point gives us the regular figure or the platonic solid of the pyramid, which is uh, the fourth stage of the tetractus and gives us our first solid geometry. From this solid figure, together with the other Platonic solids in the Timaeus, Plato has a Pythagorean speaker named Timaeus explain that we can get the world we ordinarily sense. This is an early kind of molecular or atomic theory as well on the view that Plato recommends different triangles. And remember that these Greeks use uh, geometry to do mathematics rather than algebra. So triangles can represent just like our formulae do um, basic particles or states of matter or relationships between elements of matter. So these basic two kinds of triangles interact to give us the five platonic solids and four of these kinds of solids together come together and come apart to give us the particles that go to make up our sensory reality. So in that way, we've actually come from number through point, line, plane, and solid to a sensory cosmos. And we can see a bit about how uh, more elementary Euclidean geometry can actually be for the Pythagoreans a sort of building block for the world around us in the way that Aristotle describes. And there's even more to this. Another perspective on the Tetractus that we hear about from uh, later Pythagorean authors like Theon writing on the Tetractus in the Decad is that the point can be associated with pure awareness or noose, uh, the kind of uh, experience of attentive uh, openness like knowing in Greek. The line can be associated with knowledge or understanding, episteme. There's only two points. You can't go wrong in drawing the line between subject and object. Uh, belief or doxa can be associated with the plane figure. You can go wrong here. Uh, there's more than one line you can draw between subject and object. So you can see a bit of this kind of uh, the, the characteristic symbolic thinking in Pythagoreanism, bringing these analogies together. And finally, the solid figure uh, makes sense perception possible, uh, what we can see, touch, taste, hear, and smell. This is, uh, again, in the Platonic tradition, reflecting back on earlier Pythagorean ideas, but it, it shows something of the depth of the power that they found in an explanatory sense in this idea of the Tetractus, building up reality, building up systems of mathematics and geometry, and even explaining the progress from an elementary level of deep awareness to uh, veridical knowledge or true knowledge, to representational belief where error is possible, to sense perception. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. But maybe most vivid for the Pythagoreans was music. They did a lot of experimentation with uh, musical instruments, including a simple one called the monochord, we'll look at in a minute, to try to make sense of uh, what these kinds of ideas with the Tetractus, mathematics, uh, and so on could mean. Uh, experientially. They were, as we've seen, especially interested in ratios and proportions. This is one of the reasons they were interested in rational numbers and numbers that could be expressed as ratios of fractions. Um, and in particular, we know the, the ratios of the octave, the fifth, and the fourth were important to the Pythagoreans. And I'll just take a moment to explore how they worked this out. So we imagine the monochord it's, uh, it's a pretty simple kind of one string musical instrument that Pythagoreans did some of their experimentation with. Uh, if we play the whole string, let's say we get a note, let's call it C. Um, and uh, that's pretty simple. So in a way, there's already a simple kind of prediction. The whole line of the string, when it's tuned correctly, will give you a C. Suppose we stop the string halfway, like fretting a guitar, and we uh, right at the halfway mark play, we're going to get C again, but one octave up. So this is the, the ratio of two to one. Suppose we, we uh, stop the note at a different place, uh, let's say two thirds of the original length, it turns out we're going to get a fifth or G. Uh, and one more time, let's suppose we make it three quarters of the length. Again, talking about this kind of fractional length, we're going to get an F, which is from the point of view of C, the fourth. Uh, 
So what we found is these uh, ratios, these fractions, can reliably predict the result we get in a sensory way, in sound. We've got our first C, our, uh, our fourth F, our fifth G, and our octave, uh, C one octave up. So this is just a quick uh, diagram of a monochord, uh, the actual instrument the Pythagoreans were developing and doing some of these experiments with. Um, this kind of musical experimentation was a kind of lab for them of the relationship between mathematics and observable experience, which in a way is for them the origins of scientific testing of hypotheses with observations. And it had a big cosmic consequence for them because they thought the music they were studying uh, here, even through these instruments, played right through the cosmos. Symbolically, in the music of the spheres, the planets, you might remember that was another account of the Tetractus itself and the oracle at Delphi for the Pythagoreans. Uh, so the very music that the planets and the stars sing, uh, also maybe in a deeper sense, so to speak, or in another sense, the music in the sense of mathematical ratios and proportions that are embedded in the very reality of the cosmos and allow us to understand it, predict it, and relate to it. Here's one more interesting sidebar about that. Uh, the first, the fourth, and the fifth can remind us of another genre of music. Here's an image of Mommy Smith, the mother of the blues in 1886. Uh, she was born around the time when blues music was just originating in the deep south of the United States. Rooted in African musical traditions and work songs and spirituals, uh, blues is also characterized by a progression from the first to the fourth to the fifth. Uh, so in a way, you can imagine, as lovely as the blues is, that for the Pythagoreans, the cosmos is constantly playing the blues. First, fourth, first, fifth, fourth, first. So you can find some classic blues songs like this one, uh, which is available for free, or B.B. King's great uh, version of The Thrill Is Gone, to get a, a sense of this kind of progression that the Pythagoreans had in mind. Okay, so back to a, a sort of synthesis of what we've talked about so far, having explored some of Pythagoras's ideas as well as his life. On the Pythagorean view that's associated with the school of Plato, there is a limit to the pattern we can get of rational prediction from mathematical structure, the cookie cutter. Reality or the cookie dough always overflows, if you like. Really, to be more accurate, the reality from the Pythagorean point of view is the cookie that comes from the meeting or the marriage of the cookie cutter and the cookie dough. Uh, and even before the cookie cutter and the cookie dough, there may be an earlier reality for them, but that might get a bit ahead. Number for them results from that marriage, that encounter of limiting structure that's discrete and the continuous unlimited, which they can also represent in mathematics by curves in the linear. Uh, the question of whether the circle could be squared, for example, is a nice example of this. Also, uh, the discovery of the number pi and the Pythagorean theorem itself. A way we can put it is that no matter how much we try to bound a curve with limiting lines, asymptotically getting closer, there's always an unpredictable and kind of continuing but non-repeating remainder to address. Human experience for them, though, is analogous to this kind of mathematical geometrical discovery. So in a musical metaphor, the string of meaning that's stretched between two points, between limited and unlimited, if we like, can't be tuned too tight or too loose. If you think of this in a, a sort of impressionistic way, uh, that's to say that we, on the one hand, can't uh, have the experience that we seem to understand everything, that it it's, uh, all makes sense to us, and there's nothing more to find out. Uh, we get we get bored if things are too repetitive, too predictable. On the other hand, we don't want to be wound too tight so that everything's constantly a surprise, a stress, uh, that nothing makes sense, that uh, events sort of outstrip our ability to find meaning in them. Uh, in that case, too, we can have too much stress. We can sort of be too far to one side. So from the Pythagorean point of view of, of the search for moderation, we're looking for the music that comes from this string being tuned not too tight, not too loose, so that we are finding meaning and surprise, but we're not overwhelmed. In this sense, observed experience uh, might overflow the patterning of meaning that we find there, but we're always finding meaning more. We're always coming back to it to learn.
uh, this is very much embedded in how some of the later Pythagoreans and Platonists understand the word philosophia, the love of wisdom. We don't already have wisdom in this sense, but we're searching for it as human beings. We're always aspiring to learn more. And it's like how Socrates spends his life trying to interpret the enigma or the riddle, uh, the sort of deeper esoteric mystery of the oracle that he's been given. Uh, so that's one way that the different mathematical and more spiritual or ethical views of the Pythagoreans are linked. We can also see a way that even metempsychosis, the idea of the, uh, the soul or psyche being instantiated in many different bodies, is linked to some of these mathematical uh, notions about the underlying patterns in the world. On the Pythagorean view, the human psyche is also a kind of pattern or a tuning, a harmonia, the root of our word harmony. Uh, and so I, if you like, the psyche that I am, is a pattern that can occur across many media, like a chord progression, like the blues we had a moment ago, a tuning, a unique song that can be played on many different instruments, a tuning that can occur or a chord progression that can occur in many media. So in this sense, too, it makes sense to connect the notion of patterns as the deep structure of reality with this notion of human immortality. The pattern that we most distinctly recognize in each other's humanity is immortal and is who we really are. It's the meanness of me, if you like. This sort of idea we can also see as, as influential in later Greek philosophy, for example, in the Stoic notion of the idios poion or the unique quality that kind of determines uh, the you-ness of you and the me-ness of me. There's a lot more to say about um, both Pythagoras' own ideas and the uh, extraordinary legacy of developments, scientific, philosophical, mathematical, ethical, in later Pythagoreanism. One to mention is the theory of the central fire associated with the Pythagorean Philolaeus um, and uh, in the cosmology the Pythagoreans develop, this suggests that the earth may not be at the center of the cosmos, but a central fire kind of anticipating maybe a more heliocentric model could be. There's also very interesting developments in virtue ethics and in many different Pythagorean theories associated with women like Theano and Perictyony, sometimes associated with the mother of Plato. We'll be talking about both of these figures a little bit later as well. But just to say that uh, Pythagoras's teaching is the beginning of a long tradition that continues for generation, uh, generations and generations in Greek thought. And maybe that itself could be a nice example of this notion that we're continually interpreting and reinterpreting these enigmata, these wise sayings. They might overflow, but as philosophers who are curious, we come back to them again. A uh, little bit to say just briefly about the sources. Aristotle, we've talked about before, as an important source for our knowledge of earlier philosophers. For much of the Pythagorean biography and kind of intellectual history, Aristotle, like the other Platonists, is also quite important. Uh, I say in a guarded way, Aristotle with the other Platonists. Uh, some scholars have argued that Aristotle himself is uh, devoted to a relatively Platonic philosophy, as, as Lloyd Gerson has, has recently suggested. Um, but I also mean it in the sense that Aristotle was an academic, a student of the academy who developed a similar institution and was interested in the history of philosophy in a comparable way. In this case, as we've mentioned a little bit earlier in this series, Aristotle's framework of four kinds of causation that philosophers work out gave him a structuring system or criterion to organize his knowledge about earlier philosophers. And the Pythagoreans and what Aristotle says about them uh, are no exception to this rule. According to Aristotle, uh, the Pythagoreans were particularly interested in formal causation on his terms, that is, the patterns or blueprints according to which phenomena develop. And uh, partly because of this, Aristotle focuses on their, their influence on theories of patterns quite deeply and on their mathematical views. And as in so many other cases, Aristotle helps to shape our knowledge of the Pythagoreans. But this broader Pythagorean tradition, as we've seen, runs through many authors and the ancient imagination uh, in a way that continues to capture our imagination today. So just to sum up where we've been, we've talked a bit about the island of Samos and the community of Croton, two locations especially associated with Pythagoras. We've looked at the course of his life and travels, 
and the nature of the Pythagorean communities. And we've explored some of these key ideas, both in religion, again, our category, in a way rather than Pythagoras's own, but these more spiritual or religious ideas as they're seen uh, looking back, and uh, mathematical or scientific notions. And thematically, we've also really focused on this, this search for patterns in Pythagoreanism and how recognizing that whether it's a mathematical pattern or it's the psyche of a person, recognizing patterns as the real reality is in the DNA of what Pythagoreanism is about.